Welcome to the latest Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights podcast. Hello and welcome to Taxing Lyrical, the Evershed Sutherland podcast providing topical conversations for curious tax professionals. In this episode, we're going to discuss the changes which will apply to the UK's construction industry scheme, the CIS, from the 6th of April 2024, including a new regulation which will exclude many landlord to tenant payments from the scope of the CIS. My name's Rebecca Sandwell, and I'm a professional support lawyer in the London tax team at Evershed Sutherland. I'm joined today by Charlie Stodell, who is a partner in the London tax team at Evershed Sutherland, and Anisha Polson, who is a principal associate in the same team. Both Charlie and Anisha specialise in real estate taxation and have a wealth of experience in relation to the application of the CIS in practice. Many thanks, Charlie and Anisha, for joining me on the podcast today. Charlie, please could you set the scene by briefly explaining to our listeners the purpose of the CIS and how it works? Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. So the construction industry scheme is a special regime that was actually created as long ago as 1972, but it's taken several forms since then. And now we've got a fully um, electronic uh, system, which makes it a lot easier for taxpayers to comply with in terms of verifying subcontractors online. But Basically, the revenue brought it in because they were worried about the fact that in the construction industry, there was quite a high record of people being paid and then not accounting for tax on the profits they made from that work. So in 2007, the the CIS was revised and brought up speed with the rest of the the modern world. Um, um, But basically, they wanted to improve compliance with tax obligations. So the current framework, which we all look at now when we're drafting documents and advising, is set out in the Finance Act 2004 and also in the 2005 regulations. And essentially how it works is if you are a person paying for construction works, you are required, if you are a contractor under the scheme, to withhold tax from that payment unless you can verify that the person to whom you're making the payment, the subcontractor, is registered with what's called gross payment status. And the withholdings can vary from nothing at all, if you can verify that the subcontract is registered, to up to 30% if they're actually not registered at all with the scheme. And that's how it works. Thanks, Charlie. That's really helpful. Anisha, I understand that you, Charlie, and your other real estate tax colleagues at Evershed Sutherland mainly see the CIS applying in the context of your construction developer practice and in the context of landlord to tenant contributions. Please, could you explain how the CIS applies in those contexts? Yes, of course, Rebecca. Over the number of years, we've seen plenty of scenarios and deals where landlords and tenants have had to grapple with the CIS. Uh, For example, where a tenant enters into an agreement for lease with landlords. If as part of the deal, the tenant is also agreeing to carry out certain works for the landlord, then the the tenant and its advisors have to consider whether one, the landlord is a deemed contractor, whereby you look at the landlord and try and find out if they've spent over three million pounds in the previous year of construction spent, two, whether a contract payment is being made to the tenant for carrying out those works, and three, to discuss with the tenant whether the tenant is registered to receive gross payments as gross. There are a couple of practical issues that this throws up for both the landlord and the tenant. So from the landlord's perspective, it is additional administrative burden. They have to register as a contractor, comply with the requirements under the legislation, and ultimately it is the landlord's responsibility to ensure that they've verified any subcontractors before payments are made. From the tenant's perspective, and this could be any tenant really, you know, your retail tenants such as supermarkets, shops, or it could be financial institutions looking for their next big HQ. So it really captures the full sort of spectrum of tenants in the market and there's nothing sort of separating the high value deals from the low value deal every tenant can potentially fall into this and from the tenant's perspective um, this can be quite a costly um, application because um, to go for gross payment status it takes time it takes uh, you know production of lots of evidence and this could delay deals if they're not registered for gross payment it means that they suffer the withholding and therefore, the work that they carry out, they might suffer some, you know, uh, they're having to plug the gap in terms of uh, funds to uh, funds for the works. Just thinking, in each whether it's worth saying there, because sometimes we, we get a lot of questions, don't we, on what happens if there is a withholding? How does it work? 
And it's probably important to know that if you are a tenant, it's not a requirement to be registered for gross payment status. And if you are a retailer, for example, with a lot of employees, then you can recover any withholding back on your PAYE. So it could be you get it back in a month. If you're an entity which doesn't have many employees, it can take the end of the year. So, but it's not something that's lost altogether. Throwing that in. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, as Charlie said, it's meant to be a cash flow issue, essentially. Um, but it is a cash flow issue. And it's a time and point for tenants as well. So those are the kind of areas that we come across most often. Um, as being problematic when the CIS rules, as they currently stand, apply. And, and I suppose we, we, we'd also mention our construction colleagues, wouldn't we, yes, in the fact that, of yes, of course, so when we're doing any sort of development funding agreement or indeed anything in the construction space, the construction industry scheme is something to be to be looked at. And I suspect that's where we see our, our clients actually registering for, for gross payment status and actually some of these changes will impact in that area as well. Thanks both. I think that leads us nicely on to my next question, which is, as I mentioned at the start of the episode, these changes that will apply to the CIS on the 6th of April 2024. Charlie, could you outline the changes and explain how they will affect the situations that you've been describing in which you see the CIS applying in practice at the moment? I certainly can. On the 27th of April 2023, the Revenue published a consultation on CIS reform, and that really kicked off this whole process. Um, Following that consultation, uh, legislation was included in the Finance Bill 2023, which received Royal Assent in t- February 2024. So the key date for everyone on this podcast is that these changes are going to come into force on the 6th of April 2024. They really are split into two categories. One bucket, if you like, of changes is to do with the gross payment status and the changes to that. And the other bucket, if you like, is is to do with how um, contributions between landlord and tenants, which Anisha has just outlined, is something we come across all the time, how that is, is being changed and hopefully simplified, or that's at least their intention. So from 6th of April, gross payment status may be cancelled on the grounds of fraud in relation to PAYE, corporation tax, or income tax self-assessment returns, or VAT. Now, the compliance with VAT obligations has been added to the compliance test for gross payment. And that wasn't there before. So that wasn't actually something that had to be considered. So for our construction colleagues, this is something that um, anyone registering under the Act as a subcontractor will now have to deal with and may need advice on so they can come and speak to us about that at any point. I think what the government was intending to do is to tackle serious non-compliance within the construction sector, which is what this whole scheme was brought in to do anyway. But I think they were looking at the supply chain fraud involving CIS and VAT in particular. And I think the separation before wasn't helpful to the revenue in in protecting itself. So just following that chain along, in March 2024, the um, CIS Amendment Regulations 2024 were made. And again, it's the same date that these regulations apply from. There's been a bit of movement. The original regulations that they proposed are actually not the um, regulations that that are now in force. So what we've got now is a new regulation 20A, which excludes certain payments made between a landlord and a tenant, so from a landlord to a tenant, and they remove that payment from the definition of contract payment for CIS purposes. Just pausing there, I think the one uncertainty is the fact that there was an expectation that this would just remove any payment from a landlord to a tenant as a contribution under an AFL. Not sure it's quite that simple. We're aware of industry representatives having a meeting with revenue representatives. Just to set out the condition that people have been talking about, in 20A, the payment is not a contract payment. If it's made by a landlord, the person receiving the the payment is a tenant. The payment is for construction operations agreed in connection with a lease or to enter into a lease. The tenant that occupies the property will carry out the construction operations or will hire someone else to do it, pursue into a contract with the tenant and and this is the key point the payment is for construction operations relating to works intended primarily for the benefit and use of the tenant and that's the point that I think there's some still some uncertainty on and I believe the industry is sort of waiting for detailed guidance to be published by the revenue to see how they interpret that you know uh, benefit to the tenant it's quite drafted very widely in the legislation But of course, the revenues interpretation will be important. And so we think what might become key when we're looking at these AFLs is looking still 
at the reinstatement provisions and trying to ascertain whether the landlord's gleaning any significant benefit from the works. And that may still be something that we need to consider on a case by case basis. So I don't think that's completely gone away. The other more minor point, I suppose, from our perspective that won't hit the drafting so much is the inclusion of VAT in the compliance test for gross payment status will mean that there might be more subcontractors falling outside the gross payment status. Although we do know that minor failures will be disregarded, but what the key with that is that it's done on a month. Uh, the reporting is done on a monthly or quarterly basis, which is very different from direct tax. So the point being, there, there's more opportunity for the revenue to monitor compliance with that than there is with your direct taxes. So I think that's just one to watch, and it's just key to note that reverse premiums continue to be excluded from the scope of the CIS by Regulation 20. Now that has always been the case. So Murray was in a concern when I think some of the guidance suggested that that might be taken out. Oh, yeah, good to hear they didn't do that. No, we were, we were very pleased. We were very pleased. I think actually we influenced them not taking it out. I think it was in the first regulations and I think we pushed back quite heavily, didn't we? Yes, I think Anisha wrote a very strongly worded um, response with the help of Rebecca. So I think that's good to see. So where you've got a pure inducement payment being paid under an AFL, that's still excluded from the CS as it always was. And that's really a summary of the changes. Great. Thanks, Charlie. That's really helpful. And looking to the future, Anisha, are there any other areas of the CIS in which you would like to see further reforms? Yes, I think we as a team considered this in more detail when the consultation came out and we looked at some of the proposals being put forward and we responded uh, to those. And two of the ones I wanted to just pick up was a proposal included which where the government was suggesting establishing a CIS grouping arrangement in a very similar vein to, I suppose, back groups, which we're all very familiar with, but having a similar t- a scenario in CIS, we responded saying that would be a good idea. But I think the government has concluded, unfortunately, that at this point in time, to implement a grouping arrangement would require a lot of investment or be IT based. So at the moment, I think partly for cost based you know, from a cost perspective, it's not a very viable solution for them. Um, they haven't ruled it out. So perhaps in the future, it might be something that they pursue. Uh, and I think it would make it helpful for big, you know, groups of companies where they have multiple portfolios sitting across the group to have a grouping arrangement. It might make it simpler. Uh, another point was, again, very similar to the AT having a database which, you know, advisors and clients can check using UTR numbers to see if an entity is gross registered or not. Because at the moment, I think you have to go via the government gateway portal, which only clients and their immediate sort of tax compliance agents can do. And it's not more widely available. Those are probably the two one, the two I would be looking out for. Great. So things to think about in the future and watch out for, as you say. That concludes this episode. Thank you very much, Charlie and Anisha. For further information in relation to the imminent changes to the CIS, you can read the briefing prepared by the Evershed Sutherland Tax Team, which is published on our website. We'll include a link to the briefing in the episode description. Thank you for listening to Taxing Lyrical. We hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Thank you for listening to the Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights Podcast. 